Welcome back to Linear Algebra. In this video, we're going to be talking about vectors in real space. From your previous mathematics coursework, you should already be familiar with some of the basic ideas of vectors in the two-dimensional plane or in the three-dimensional space. Vectors are, uh, we generally think of as arrows pointing from one spot to another spot. It helps if I don't gesture way off camera, I apologize. Um, throughout this course, we're going to look at the idea of vectors and we're going to extend it well beyond that basic picture. But starting there to give us a foundation is going to be a good uh, route for the rest of the ideas that we build up on. So let me get my head out of the way and let's start in with some basic vocabulary. A scalar is an object which has a magnitude. In this course, we're going to be dealing with scalars that take on real values. So a scalar is some object A, which is contained in the real numbers. All right, the symbols there are things we're going to be using throughout this course. So if you've not seen them before, This kind of E looking thing, it's more strictly a C with an extra line in the middle of it, is called the element of operator. And this R with an extra line in it, it's called a blackboard bold R. Is the set of all real numbers. These are ideas that you should have come across in a previous math course, but depending on your background, depending on where you took the courses, the specific notation might be new to you. To contrast this, a vector is an object with a magnitude and direction. And when we talk about a vector, we're generally going to use a symbol like a V. I'm going to try to keep in the habit of putting an arrowhead above my vectors for Euclidean vectors. Although, as I said in the opening, we are going to be looking at vectors that are not Euclidean vectors. And it's going to turn out that this definition is not going to be all that useful throughout the entire course. And again, we're going to generalize things, but for right now, we're looking at vectors in R2, the two-dimensional space, and vectors in R3, the three-dimensional space. There are several different ways that you may have seen vectors written in the past. The most common is component form, where the x and y for a two-dimensional vector, or x, y, and z for a three-dimensional vector, are enclosed in angle brackets. You may also have seen unit vectors. So we could write V as X 
I hat plus Y J hat, or we could write V as X I hat plus Y J hat plus Z K hat, if um, that is more your style. You may have also seen vectors given as magnitude and direction, especially for two-dimensional vectors, something like a magnitude of r at a direction of theta. That's not something that is going to be very useful to us in this course. I'm not even going to bother writing it down. Even these two representations, component form and unit vector form, again, hopefully things that you've seen before, we're going to move away from them in the next video and go on to something that generalizes a little bit more nicely, but it is just different ways of writing the same object, right? The vector V given with components X and Y or the vector V given as X I hat plus Y J hat is the exact same vector, not just different representations, different vectors that have the same meaning, literally the same vector written in two different styles. And of course, when we have some vectors, we are able to do some operations on them. So for example, if I have the vector three, five and the vector four, negative one, and I want to add these two things together, I add component by component. In the X component, I have three plus four, which is seven. In the Y component, I have five plus negative one, which is four. we can do scalar multiplication. A scalar, again, is a thing without a direction. So we generally write that as a number in front. And so if we have something like four times the vector, two, five, negative three, we multiply component by component. Four times two is eight. 4 times 5 is 20, 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. And once we have vector addition and scalar multiplication, we can combine those two ideas. The most important thing that we can do with vectors in linear algebra is to take a linear combination of two vectors. In general, a linear combination is some constant C1 times some vector V1 plus some constant C2 times some vector V2. It's just scalar multiplication and vector addition. It doesn't feel like it should be that big of a deal. But it turns out that when we can think about linear combinations, we can do a lot. So if I have the vector or the linear combination, three times the vector two, five minus four times the vector one, seven. I can first go through the scalar multiplication. Then I can do the vector addition. And this particular linear combination is 2, negative 13. Right. Again, 
it doesn't feel like a lot. And for our purposes right now, it honestly isn't a lot. The calculations that we're doing are dead simple. Uh, they should be things that you can do in your sleep. The notation and the vocabulary are the interesting bits here. So when we talk about a linear combination, we're talking about just doing these sorts of calculations. Although as you can probably guess, at this point in your mathematics career, it's going to get a lot more complicated. Uh, when I say that linear combinations are going to be important, what I mean is actually this thing up here that we started with. Very often in this course, we're going to be looking at wanting to do something to a linear combination and then working backwards to figure out which linear combination we started with. And with this, I actually have enough to finally tell you, what is linear algebra? Linear algebra is the study of operations that behave nicely around linear combinations. That probably still doesn't mean a lot to you, but I think it's immense that thinking about vectors and thinking about linear combinations of vectors is going to be important throughout the course. Some operations behave very nicely around linear combinations. Some operations very much do not. We're going to spend a couple of weeks building up some basic theory and vocabulary and notation. And then we'll start exploring what makes a good operation to study in linear algebra and what makes something a little bit more challenging. Moving onward, there is another operation on vectors that you should be familiar with. That is the vector dot product. And so if we have a couple of vectors, say the vector uh, two, five, negative three, and we want to dot it with the vector four, negative one, two, the rule for a dot product is to multiply component by component. Two times four is eight. Five times negative one is negative five. Negative three times two is negative six. And the thing to keep in mind is that the dot product does not give you a vector as a result. The dot product takes two vectors and turns them into a scalar. We simply perform the arithmetic, addition or subtraction from this point. Eight minus five is three. Three minus six is negative three. The dot product of these two vectors is negative three. Great. That's again, takes us to something where it's very important to think about. When we are doing operations on vectors, Sometimes we will have an operation that takes a vector and a scalar. Sometimes we will have an operation that takes two vectors. Sometimes we will have an operation that spits out a vector. Sometimes we will have an operation that results in a scalar. And keeping track of what kind of thing you have going through the algebra is going to be tricky. For that matter, keeping track of what kind of vector you have is going to be something that becomes more complicated. But even here, I've worked with two vectors in R3 in this particular problem. I could have done two vectors in R2, but if I had mixed vectors, this wouldn't have worked. You can't take a two-dimensional vector and a three-dimensional vector and try to dot them together. It just doesn't work. So that's something else that we have to pay attention to and be careful of as we go through. All right, one last operation on vectors with which you should be familiar is the norm or magnitude. And sometimes I'll see the norm or magnitude written using absolute value bars. And honestly, when I teach calculus, that's the notation that I use. But in linear algebra, it's going to be important to distinguish it as something different. The norm is something that we do to a vector. 
And so to make sure that it looks like something we do to a vector, I'm going to put it in double absolute value bars. And so if we have in double absolute value bars, some sort of a vector, I'm sorry, I'm writing down the wrong vector. There we go. Say the vector 4, 12, 3. The norm asks us about the magnitude of the vector, as the name says. And we think about that using essentially the Pythagorean theorem. To find the norm of a vector in R2 or in R3, we're going to take each of the components of the vector, we're going to square it, we're going to add them together, and then we're going to take the square root of the whole lot. In this particular case, 4 squared is 16, 12 squared is 144, 3 squared is 9. 16 plus 144 is 160, 160 plus 9 is 169. And the square root of 169 is 13. All right. All right. So those are the operations on vectors with which you should already be familiar. Before I wrap up on this video, I want to go into one new thing. Once again, depending on your path coming into this class, the idea of theorem and proof may or may not be familiar to you. Uh, in mathematics, looking at individual problems like we have throughout this video is useful, but not generally interesting. The goal of mathematics is to look at something general and be able to create a rule that allows us to shortcut things in the long run. We do that by naming theorems and then proving the theorem. And there is a theorem that's fairly straightforward that I can use on the norm of a vector. So let's clear this out of the way and let's talk a little bit about theorem and proof. All right, so my theorem here for a vector, let's call it vector v, and I'm going to do this in two dimensions. We could do the same thing in three dimensions just as well. So let's say that vector v has components x and y. It has two components, which means it's a vector in two-dimensional space. For a vector v given as components x, y in two-dimensional space, I claim that the norm of v is equal to the square root of the dot product of v with itself. This is actually a fairly straightforward result. It may even be a result that you've used in the past. Uh, the result itself isn't really the interesting thing. The interesting thing is using this result as a way to start talking about mathematical proof. So when we have a theorem, when we have a claim, we need to prove that claim. And to prove a claim, we write down that we're going to prove the claim. And then we start working through the algebra to try to figure out how we can show that this works. A couple of hints on how to get started on a proof. When you are writing a proof, the theorem is something that is known to you, 
And so there's some information there. We know that V is a vector. I've specified that we have a vector in R2, but a vector in general is what we have. My theorem relates the norm of the vector and the dot product of the vector. Well, I know what the norm of a vector is. The norm of vector v is the square root of x squared plus y squared. And I know what the dot product of a vector is. Right? V dot V means XY dot XY. And to take the dot product, you multiply the X components. X times X is X squared you multiply the y components. y times y is y squared, and you add them together. And just like that, we have everything we need because we have an x squared plus y squared right there. We also have an x squared plus y squared right there. And we know that x squared plus y squared is the same thing as v dot v. And so one last step, We can say by substitution, replace x squared plus y squared with v dot v, and we get that the norm of v is in fact equal to the square root of v dot v. All right, the last thing to do in a proof is to close the proof. Uh, we do that with what is called a QED symbol. or sometimes a QED tombstone. And in mathematics, the most common tombstone is literally draw a small square and fill it in, or kind of scribble it mostly filled in. Um, in specific branches of mathematics, slight variations on the tombstone symbol are used. It's called a QED symbol because in early mathematics, uh, when mathematics was entirely done in Latin, instead of writing a QED uh, tombstone, they literally wrote the letters QED with a grand flourish. Uh, QED stands for quod erat demonstratum, and thus I have shown it. Um, but, you know, QED tombstone symbol, a lot easier to write, makes a lot more sense. And it's a nice way of punctuating this proof is over. Uh, in this course, I am going to be asking you to prove things. And when I ask you to prove things, you should get into the habit of closing your proof with a tombstone symbol like this. There are other options. Um, an open square is pretty common in some branches of mathematics. In physics, using a couple of slashes instead of a square at all is a relatively common choice. Uh, I've seen other options in other disciplines as well. I don't have a proof for you for today, but I do want to end this video with a practice problem for you to try. Uh, this is messy for the sake of being messy, I'll be perfectly honest, but I want you to think through the logic of what we are doing with this to make sure that everything makes sense. So going back to our operations, I would like you to 
take a look at this expression. Vector with components two, five, plus the quantity of vector one, one, two, dot vector negative one, two, one, and then vector three, one. Once again, computationally not difficult, but notationally cumbersome. And thinking through and making sure you're keeping straight the notation and what kind of object you have as you go through is very important to solving this problem. All right, take a couple of minutes to see what you can get with that one. And I'll see you in the next video.